I'm so honored to run this panel because it consists of, uh, you know, very bright specialists in Mennonite history. And um, I'm sure that you have read a, a lot of articles published on them, so they're real experts. And the first presenter today, and I'm also very happy to uh, introduce him is Johannes Dick. It's my friend. That is why. Uh, so Johannes Dick was born in a deportation place in Eastern Siberia, Soviet Union, and grew up in Karaganda, Kazakhstan, a city with the largest Mennonite and German population in late Soviet times. In 1989, his family and he immigrated to Germany. Currently, he is a research fellow at the Museum of Russian German Cultural History in Detmold. I'm sure many of you are aware of this uh, very important place. He currently research is about Anabaptist tradition in the Soviet Union since the World War II. And his presentation today is uh, Soviet religion policy and Mennonite concerns in the 1920s. That is his really favorite subject. Uh, first of all, um, my great thanks for the invitation to this conference. As a Russland Deutscher, I feel a special affinity with the subject of the conference, the Russlander Mennonites. I would like to share with you today some observations of a person who has lived uh, half of his life in the country your ancestors once left. Um, the October Revolution of 1917 forced uh, the, the search for new answers uh, to old questions. Let me begin with a simple question. Who were the Mennonites? Discussions of our grandparents who, along with Benjamin Unruh, meditated about transition of Russian Mennonites from a cultic to a cultural community, and where the descendants reflected on natural or forced secularization uh, suddenly became obsolete. Mennonites have again become a minority with 100,000 in the midst of uh, 100 million um, without any privilege. And this determi uh, determines the, time of, uh, the theme of my paper. The professional revolutionaries who seized power cared nothing for the continuity of their approach to religion with the Tsarist government, there were, was no longer any place in their picture of religion of foreign confessions, as uh, this was under, uh, under the Tsar. Um, uh, the struggle uh, against uh, religion occupied one of the main places of the Bolshevik agenda uh, very early. On January 20, 1918, uh, three months after the October coup, the Ministry of Justice uh, prepared a draft uh, degree on a separation of church and state. And the original version of, of this uh, decree uh, was uh, written from the generally accepted European social democratic uh, needs of uh, secular state and worldview pluralistic society. The uh, chairman of the government, um, the ardent atheist Vladimir Lenin, amended the first paragraph of the decree, uh, you uh, see it um, on the slide. As a result, religion in the Soviet Union never became a private matter for the citizens of the Republic. The decree didn't lose the significance until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Paragraph 9 served as the justification for the prohibition of the participation of children in the religion services. Uh, and in November 1923, um, um, a Baptist elder in Nova Vasilyevka, it is in the region where uh, uh, Mennonites settled uh, 
uh, was required personally uh, to ensure that no one under 18 years of age uh, could uh, attend the uh, prayer meetings. There were two wings in the Soviet religious uh, policy. The first uh, saw the church as a political enemy. The second aimed to make the church Soviet in its essence. The first uh, link of the left side um, represents uh, people like uh, Stalin, uh, like um, the head uh, of the um, uh, secret police, and so on. The uh, second uh, links, uh, link uh, represented um, uh, people that were uh, more tolerant uh, to, the, uh, to religion. Uh, the struggle against the religion uh, from the beginning on was very hard and consisted of two phases. The first began immediately after the revolution, was directed primarily against the Russian Orthodox Church. The second phase was directed against the sects and began gaining speed in August uh, 1923. All units of the Soviet power took part in the fight against religion. It was inspired by the party, the uh, red uh, uh, stripe there. Uh, the, um, they were the government uh, uh, consisting uh, of the People's uh, Commissariat of the Internal Affairs. Uh, uh, NKVD, I used the uh, Russian uh, uh, letters. Uh, that included the secret police. And uh, parallel to them, there was a People Commissariat of Justice. They represented the government. And we had also the executive authority. All three parts, uh, or all three uh, those, uh, those uh, objects, uh, they uh, took part um, in, the, in fighting uh, religion. Um, the first uh, concern, non-resistance, and the Mennonites discovered uh, uh, Ellis on uh, October 22, uh, 1918, uh, the Revolutionary Military Council of the Republic issued an order on the attitude to persons who don't accept uh, participation in uh, military service because of their religious beliefs. On the same day, uh, Peter Fröse, who settled in Moscow in 1917 and represented uh, Mennonite interests, uh, he uh, took part uh, in a meeting uh, uh, that later was uh, known as the United Council of Religious Congregations and Groups. And on the same day, they issued a lengthy statement on exemption from the military services. And the representative in this group were from the Mennonites, from the Evangelical Christian Baptists, uh, uh, from the uh, Tolstoyans, um, one more uh, uh, Russian group, and the uh, Adventists, uh, just two pictures. Um, uh, we see uh, Peter uh, Fröse and uh, Vladimir Chertkov, uh, Tolstoyan, a very influential uh, person at uh, those um, times. And um, um, this uh, uh, person, Vladimir Chertkov, uh, had um, uh, connections uh, uh, to the government. Um, on December 5, uh, he um, had uh, given a, a document uh, to the government, and one month later, the government uh, issued uh, a new decree that um, gave a possibility for exemption from military service. So the Ellis uh, mechanism uh, worked. The second concern, uh, legal ex uh, existence of congregations. And uh, we had a first uh, 
attack um, on this um, uh, legal um, uh, operation mode uh, of congregations. And uh, in uh, August 1922, uh, the executive uh, branch of the uh, Soviet power issued uh, a resolution regulating the legal sta status of non-profit societies. And they issued an instruction, and this instruction uh, should be applied to religious, religious associations as well. And uh, Siberia became a testing ground for the means of combating uh, sectarianism. Uh, the anti-sectarian operation began on uh, November 22, uh, 22nd on 1922, when uh, all provincial executive authorities were ordered to check the registration of all non-profit societies and to close all unregistered, unregistered uh, ones by January 1st, 23. Month later, uh, December 27th, there was a new demand um, uh, to re-register the non-profit uh, making societies and close by January 10th um, those who had not managed to re-register or remained uh, unregistered. And uh, the religious societies were uh, specifically mentioned. And um, it happened um, that uh, most of the congregations continued to operate despite the ban and uh, uh, repression. Uh, in this um, uh, time, the Mennonites, for example, in Slavgorod, Siberia, uh, lost a school for 80 people and a uh, house of worship for 85 people. Uh, but uh, the uh, local um, uh, churches uh, started uh, to appeal to the central government, and the central government uh, closed uh, this operation. Now we have uh, the next uh, uh, mm, uh, next uh, actor, a new actor, an anti-religious commission. It was Stalin's creation, created uh, in October 1922. It uh, worked uh, top secret, so we got uh, the, the uh, documents uh, of, of this uh, commission published in the beginning of the uh, 2000. Uh, 2000 years, uh, uh, 2000 plus. And the idea was uh, to have a, a core that defines the politics, and it should be consisted of a party and uh, secret police. And uh, the purpose was unified guidance of church and uh, uh, church politics in the center and uh, locally in a constant uh, connection with uh, secret police, agit pop government, and the executive uh, uh, organs. Um, we have uh, uh, th uh, three main columns uh, in this construction. The left one is uh, agit prop, the right one uh, is um, uh, secret police, and the uh, people, uh, the, the person um, uh, in the bottom, on the uh, r right side, uh, Evgeny Tuchkov was the, the secretary, and he comes from the mm, uh, secret police, and um, he, uh, he decided a lot of things. Uh, we see mm, uh, people from the uh, justice um, mm, uh, part of the mm, uh, justice um, uh, commissariat, uh, and uh, from the um, executive um, branch, but they were just a representative there. Um, we have uh, the first attack from the uh, new anti-religious uh, commission, and uh, this commission identified uh, in 22, November 22, uh, two categories of sects. Um, the first one uh, that is definitely loyal to the Soviet power and posing no danger to uh, the Soviet power, like uh, Molokans or Duhabors, and the second part, uh, those um, inclined to bourgeois restoration and having considerable connections 
and counter revolutionary foreign circles. Uh, circles. So people with connections to foreign circles, uh, I think that Mennonites uh, are perfect uh, for uh, this description. Uh, so um, they um, took uh, as the first um, object uh, uh, of attack uh, Ivan Prokhanov, a leader of the evangelical Christians. He had a very authoritarian lead leadership style he was the first uh, victim. Uh, September 22, uh, uh, he um, uh, did, uh, uh, he issued uh, um, uh, appeal to uh, worldwide uh, reformation uh, called Voice from the uh, East. Uh, uh, and uh, in this uh, uh, document, he has uh, just um, uh, two lines uh, about uh, uh, non-resistance, uh, not more. Um, Prokhanov uh, was uh, arrested on April 5th uh, and uh, in prison. Uh, he uh, was subjected to severe pressure and as a result he was he radically changed his attitude towards Soviet power in general and non-resistance in particular. On June 12th, the anti-religious commission agreed to use Prokhanov to change the sectarian view of the Red Army. A month later, he was relieved uh, to travel to the Baptist World Alliance uh, Congress in Stockholm. Um, and uh, there he, in Stockholm, he um, uh, tried um, uh, to um, um, reverse the situation. He entered the Baptist World Union with a proposal of uh, non-resistance on a worldwide uh, scale within the Baptist uh, uh, context. Uh, this didn't happen. And um, after that, um, the Congress of Evangelical Christian Baptists um, um, in October um, uh, 23, um, he was attended uh, by Tuchkov himself. Uh, Tuchkov, um, the, the secret police uh, person, he demonstratively pressured Prokhanov uh, the, uh, and the uh, delegates, and he got his um, desired uh, resolution. The Baptists were the next. Um, but uh, they resisted more strongly, and they passed a neutral resolution, in part sounded uh, in a Mennonite uh, manner. Uh, they um, agreed uh, or they approved an uh, alternative service and the possibility of service in sanitation units, and the third one, personal beliefs. Uh, uh, Tuchkov was uh, outraged, uh, the GPU arrested several leaders of the Baptist Union, and uh, two months later, uh, on February 1st, 24, the shortened leadership of the Baptist Union issued a memorandum uh, to the entire Baptist Brotherhood in the Soviet Union with the rejection of uh, non-resistant uh, uh, stance. What was uh, next? Uh, uh, the um, pressure on the sects. Um, in uh, May 1924, the 13 party congress declared that the sectarians are no longer companions of the revolution, but opponents of socialist construction, both in the city and in the countryside. Uh, in uh, August, um, the party changed the main actor in the visible religious politics, uh, making him the executive um, uh, committee of different levels. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, is the point when we can uh, consider the Mennonite concerns. Uh, on May the 23rd, um, 1924, the um, a committee for church affairs um, consisting of Jakob Rempel, Johann Wiebe, and Jakob Janssen uh, submitted um, 
um, a memorandum to the government, eight points, um, freedom of assembly, systematic work um, with the next generation, uh, Mennonite orphanages, um, religious literature, uh, training of preachers, uh, propaganda free schools, exemption from military service, and uh, replacing the oath with a simple uh, promises. Uh, what were Mennonites to expect in the face of uh, growing uh, threats to the religion? Could they hope to remain an exception? How were they better or worse than similar denominations? How much could they, as a history church, hope to retain their right of non-resistance? Uh, so here is a t an attempt to provide some answers based on general trends. Um, five out of uh, eight expectations already in 1924 uh, were impossible. Uh, so um, the rest um, of, of these uh, concerns, uh, they turned um, um, uh, to things that also were impossible, and um, we um, had to uh, think about that, uh, and uh, we are uh, children of uh, that generation and uh, grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Next, our presenter is a, a person with a wonderful personality. It's Edward Kran. Uh, since 1974, Edward Kran has been a curator, museum director, researcher, historian, government museum manager, special event cultural coordinator, and heritage contractor on community development. He has sat on the board of two provincial museum associations and the National CMA Board, along with having served on the editorial board of the Virtual Museum of Canada. In 2012, he was recognized for his effort in cultural development by being presented with the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal. He is currently a member of Eastman Historical Committee and the Manitoba Mennonite Historical Society. Uh, his today's presentation is the Faithful 77, the General Conference of Mennonite Congregations in Russia. Thank you very, thank you very much. Wonderful opportunity to be here. A little bit of participation right now. Uh, how many of you have seen this photograph before? Good number. That's by delegates by number. So again, we're trying to find out who these individuals are. So as part of the process is going, identifying them, giving them a number. And if you've been on the Willie Vote site on the Moscow stuff with the conferences, this is where the start of numbering was. So it's been trying to tie it to that number. Uh, who knows who this is? Ah, very few. Perfect. And who was he? Perfect. Now, we have one other delegate. Who is this? Does anybody know? Do I have to ask Conrad up there who this is? No, that's not Clausen. That's uh, actually the article in the... Uh, Mennonite historian, it's Jacob Lowen from Moore Park, one of the 17 that got to Canada, of the 19 that got out, out of the 77. First, I also would like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional lands of the First Nations of Treaty 1, and the ancestral heartland of the Red River Métis people. The original intent of this document, in short bios of the history of the men and the importance of the meeting, but like most projects, Project Creep stuck in. But I felt better when I read how Aaron Taves, who wrote the two-volume Mennonite Martyrs, which originally recognized the sacrifice of the delegates, had also experienced Project Creep. 
As a child, the congregation would sing in Father's Day, faith of our fathers living still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. We will be true to thee to death. In January 1925, 73 delegates from across the Mennonite Commonwealth and four members of the Commission for Kirchen Anglican Heiten, the KFK, gathered in Moscow to lobby the Soviets for eight basic human rights. The meeting was held under the auspices of the KFK, which starting in 1912 was made responsible for arranging these meetings, the agendas, and obtaining government permission to hold the meetings. So even prior to the revolution. They had to get permission. The KFK had submitted the petition the previous May and were updating the assembly on the results. In the end, lobbying had only been successful for the short-lived publication Unzeblatt. This coming together occurred during the crisis and turmoil of the post-revolution Russia. Starvation, loss of educational controls, the alternate forestry service transitioning to militia, and the start of immigration to Canada. Not all were clergy. There were civic leaders and or industrialists like C.A. de Fer, elected by their communities. In some cases, only one representative was sent from a whole colony. In others, a number of delegates were sent. There's at least four different lists, and I think I've come across a fifth one uh, just the other day, of who these individuals are. And they all agree, except for about seven or eight of the individuals. So we're not quite sure. So we're hoping to find people that may know them that have a grandpa or somebody else that's there as well. The strategy, the, the at least, uh, no, the gatherings represented the MB and the Kirchen Gemeindes and the upstart evangelical Mennonite Brother Gemeinde, the Alliance. The strategy had worked in the past. You lobbied for change and after time accommodations were made, much like the alternate service or the medical corps. The aim was to petition the new Soviet government in respect to religion and other areas of concern. But things had changed and strategy of negotiations and accommodations proved futile. Some delegates left for Canada shortly after the conference, realizing uh, that the precarious situation they were in. Others, after returning to their community, began to organize group migrations. Some returned ready to immigrate, only to find that the congregations weren't ready. Others, like the Orenberg delegation under Altista Isaac Cron, went home and worked aggressively against immigration. They would stand up to the Soviets with the anticipation that, like in the past, accommodation would be reached. A majority of those delegates who did flee to Canada took on major roles in the MB and GC bodies, bringing new vitality. This was a period of church growth as the Ruslanders arrived. On Father's Day, my mother reminded me of my grandfather and others who had sacrificed so much to keep the faith alive. Sometimes the sermon of the day would re reference the meeting. Eltis Gerhard Lorenz was once a speaker at our church where he told the story of the meeting. He's often credited with coming to the name of the Second Martyr Synod, but, but perhaps he was just echoing the references that Aaron Taves had made in the photograph of the 77 in his Mennonitische Martyr two volume set. Lorenz had known many of the delegates at the meeting as he had been elected as a young leader from his community, one of the youngest delegates there. His historical reference to the original Anabaptist Mars in Augsburg, Bavaria, in 1527. We trust, the trust the community placed in selecting Lorenz to express their views was reflected in his abilities. As later, he's become a major leader in the Mennonite Conference and in the historical preservation of Mennonite history, both as an author and historian. That iconic photo of those 77 men in the snows of Moscow reminds us of the historical importance of this meeting for the Rislander. The resulting repression of the leadership by the state political directive, the GPU, resulted in the torture, imprisonment in the gulags, and the killing of a majority of those who remained in Russia. During the conference, a telegraph was sent by the Canadian Mennonite Board of Colonization offering help with immigration. The KFK also played a role in assisting individuals to get their own passports. Most of those who remained were arrested, exiled, or executed. Only a few died in their own beds. Most died in exile in the gulags, and in the end, only 19, of which 17 made it to Canada, escaped. The arrival of the Ruslanders brought far-reaching changes to the existing conferences in Canada. Those who had remained in Russia, in some instances, had looked with pity and disregard on those narrow-minded brethren who had immigrated in 1874. 
The earlier arrivals, in turn, viewed those liberal-minded Rustlanders with some fear. Most of the Rustlanders had lost everything, and many ministers and congregations were afraid to invite more Rustlanders to Canada. Would they have a negative impact on existing congregations? Originally, the word Rustlander had a pejorative aspect to it, but over time, the Rustlanders took it on with pride. Fundor, wir sind alle Rustlander. Here. But others saw the need to respond beyond the newly formed MCC could provide. So many opened their homes. Immigrants were sponsored. Fundraising occurred and leaders sat on committees to welcome the new arrivals and help them and assist them, like the Mennonite Board of Colonization. Those who arrived in Canada when settled in Mennonite communities joined existing churches. Others who settled in non-Mennonite areas formed their own churches and built a church as soon as they could. The next two decades brought more change to the Mennonite churches, with challenges including the Dirty Thirties, another world war, urbanization, and the loss of the German language. Those leaders both in Canada and Russia have passed on, and the memory of this important event in Moscow has become a faint memory in the minds of Mennonites today. We stand on the shoulders of giants. One of those is Aaron uh, Taves, and the Mennonitia Marketer Volumes 1 and 2. There would be no recognition and memorial of the Second Martyr Synod if not for Aaron Taves. His Volume 1 included uh, the photograph and list of the Faithful 77, at least one of the lists. The publication is the first reference and recognition in North America of the fate of those men. Anabaptists throughout their history have been aware of the heroes of their faith written with blood and tears. And I remember Professor uh, Harry Lowen in, in this university saying, you've got to bring props up when you do presentations. So I got props. And here's the Mars mirror, uh, mirror. Very good for propping things up too, very large, but good stories in there. And this is volume one. Uh, most Mennonite homes had at least two books, the Bible and Martyr's Mirror from 1660. The other part was that the props that uh, Harry Lone used to bring in was Guldervasser, so I'm sorry I didn't bring Guldervasser, but I did bring the, these books. While Taves was not one of the faithful 77, without his effort, this important story would not have been told. Taves was a teacher and a farmer who had joined the EMBG and later in Canada become an MB minister. After his arrival on June 17, 1926, and while farming in Alberta, he started his research. He was asked to deliver a paper on the theme of Mennonite martyrs in the recent past and present for an MB ministerial conference in Alberta. After the presentation, he was asked to gather more information and produce a book. As word got out, he was sent more names and stories to include families and friends for the sake of future generations who wanted a memorial of their individuals who had suffered. His intent was never to go beyond a memorial recognition of the individuals and their families. The research suffered a major loss in a fire at his farmhouse, which destroyed all his work. The resulting delay, though, had a positive aspect as it led to more information and leads as he rebuilt the documentation. As World War II ended, new information trickled in uh, from the refugees that were in, in Germany. The disjointed nature of the publications reflect how the information came together. Sometimes it was a name he was given, other times it was a number of stories the author pierced together, or complete verbatim family accounts sent to him. The new emphasis was not to just compile a list, but to tell their stories. Other individuals' stories were added who, while not martyred, had come to Canada to continue their work, but had suffered for their faith, men like Jacob A. Lowen. We recognize the importance of the financial assistance that he received from the MB conference in publishing an important history. And later, the conference in the 80s decided to make it available to a wider congregation and people. They translated that into English a partial translation of his work. Many of the narratives ended with the comment, there is no further information about the subsequent fate of the exile and prisoner. We now know what happened. We know from the International Human Rights Organization Memorial, founded in Russia, that the fate of many who ended up in the gulags across the vast Soviet Union. Families now know that the information received from the authorities that their family members were sent to new settlements wasn't true. Families, often with great sacrifice, scraped together care packages to send to the prisoners, when in fact many had been killed shortly after arrest, especially during the years of terror of 36 to 38. The authorities, fully knowing this, 
but continued with the ruse. Most of the martyrs are buried in unknown and unmarked graves in the sites of work camps and gulags across Russia. When choirs become seditious, soon, you, you, tomorrow, we will be listening to the Zangerfest, but well, there was a time that choirs were considered very seditious. When were they that? When can, when can establishment in the community choir be considered that? Well, Mennonite communities form choirs to reach youth in a workaround. During the conference, there had been much discussion on how to reach the youth, in particular since not being able to teach religion to those under 18. On the morning session of the 14th, Johann Martins from Olgefeld spoke on reaching youth through the introduction of community choirs in the Fritzland. One of the choir directors was his own brother, Peter, who in Olgefeld's choir had served as the minister and forzinger for the church. The Midnight Heritage Archives in its collection has a photograph of the George Stahl Choir taken in 1925. George Craker and Isaac Kruger were their choir leaders. The choirs would have discussions and workshops with the clergy and song leaders. The choirs were mixed and sang a variety of folk and religious music. They would get together on special occasions at Zengerfest with other choirs to compete and sing together. It brought young people together, which sometimes led to romance. The proximity of George Stahl and Algefeld led to marriages among the choir members. So when you check those family members, you find they got together at a choir meeting. Many of the First Lander group ended up in Canada in communities like Eyebrow, Parkerview, Pleasant Point, Hanley, and Rivers. Zangerfests were common in Pleasant Point, Hanley, and the Whitewater uh, Mennonite groups in Manitoba, which had a number of members from the First Land where choirs had been common. In 1926, the state political director, the GPU, reported on the foreign colonist population of Ukraine. The report noted that the KFK and Unzer Blot were tools used to get around the state's objectives. In particular, they noted how the Mennonites continued to separate themselves from others. The report spoke with concern how the clergy organized opposition and were the strongest sect in the Ukraine, and particularly how they conducted strong religious propaganda and used tools like Unzerblat to minimize the influence of the Soviet, especially as it related to youth and the clergy, creating discussion circles, which included religious questions, along with sports, choirs, and songs to reach the youth. As per previous conference norms, not all the speakers were delegates. In some cases, uh, specialists were brought in uh, to discuss topics of importance and make suggestions how they might progress in the areas. Each session was open with a message and song. Choirs and music were an important topic. The second order of the order paper for January 16 was a pres uh, presentation by specialist Franz Thiessen of Moscow. Prior to immigrating to Canada, uh, he was working at the KFK to assist Mennonites to obtain passports. He so inspired the assembly that a resolution was passed that his suggestions and implementation at the KFK should copy and share with all the Mennonite congregations. A lot of this initiative took place in the publications of Windsor Blatt. Over the years, two meetings of issues kept being brought up. A theological school had been a desire of Mennonite congregations for decades. While there had been short-lived Bible schools and summer Bible camps, for clergy, along with individuals traveling to Germany and Switzerland to take training for the ministry from non mennonite schools, they've been unable to have their own theological school to help develop a source of trained clergy. Those with higher uh, forms of education who were school teachers, uh, the new norm was to try and elect school teachers as clergy, especially those who had been teaching religion in school. The delegates heard at the conference that while the theology school had not been approved, the delegates felt enough optimism to start drawing up plans and submit another petition for it. While there was optimism, the government's direction under Stalin had changed from the more open new economic policy. After the death of Lenin, there had been uncertainty of direction while Stalin took charge to consolidate uh, his powers. The conference occurred during this transition period. While there was one success the publication of un, uh, the periodical Unzerblatt, it is expressed with great gratitude that the publication of such a paper will be permitted. The delegates were so excited that during the conference, prepaid subscriptions were sold, and by October of that year, the first issue came out. So if anybody's looking for the Mennonite Journal, so is one of our publications, you can sign up there today as well. While there have been other short-lived publications, they generally had limited audience scope. Copies of German and North American publications were circulated through libraries and reading rooms, but there had never been an official organ. 
At every conference, the opportunity had been taken to petition the Soviet for the publication. Alexander Ediger and Cornelius Martins were elected to the executive of the KFK. In turn, they were also selected as editor of Runza Blatt and Martins as the managing editor for Runza Blatt. Both men were familiar with print industry and publications. Martins, beyond running the business end of the Blatt's, also contributed a number of articles, as did Ediger. Another major contributor was David H. Epp, former chair of the KFK. He also was a historian of note and had several history books in the catechism to prepare young people for baptism. The first issue of Unser Blatt appeared in October 1925, and on the front cover are the delegates, along with a report on the conference. Unser Blatt played an important role of giving sermon ideas, introducing new hymns. There was a kid's corner with information and historical content on early Anabaptist leaders because there was a feeling that the Midnights were losing contact from where their roots were. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for uh, uh, listening. And also, uh, I do have a, a little handout in the back that lists the uh, delegates, as best I know. Uh, please take a look at it. Perfect, it's right there, it has one. And if you know anything about any of the 77, please talk to me, because I would like to also thank the Lowen family for the article I was able to do on them. They were able to provide wonderful insight, especially the impact uh, that, these, uh, that this time had on the wives and the families of these. It wasn't just the men. As the men went off and traveled, uh, the families were left at home, often to, uh, carry on as best that they could. So thank you very much. Thank you, Edward, especially for advertising uh, Mennonite historian voluntary. So our next presenter is a very, you know, brave researcher because he have he has done an amazing job explaining us about difficult process of Mennonite history in 1930s. I would say, I would confess that, uh, so I don't have Ukrainian colleagues who are so deep in this subject. Uh, our next presenter is Colin Neufeld, a professor of history at Concordia University of Edmonton. He, he, his most recent publication conclude perspectives of the Mennonite experience during the Holodomor, uh, divided loyalties, the political uh, radicalization, um, Mennonite uh, in, uh, in interval Poland, and Hitler Mennonites and the Holodomor. And his forthcoming publication is Feminine Ukraine and the Reinvention of Mennonites into Nazi Enemies of the USSR. His today's presentation is, wow, is a very alternative subject. Uh, it will be, it will get better. The case for Mennonites not to emigrate from the Soviet Ukraine. Thank you for Ukraine. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to present this afternoon. So in the 1920s, Mennonites in the Soviet Union had many good reasons to emigrate. World War I, James Urys talked about the economic devastation that the war caused for Mennonites. 1917, Russian revolutions that ultimately brought in the Soviets, those anti-religious communists. There was anti-German sentiment. Of course, Mennonites had identified with the Germans during World War I, and in fact, they actually hosted German troops in 1918. Of course, there's a Russian Civil War and war communism. Eileen Friesen talked about the devastation that uh, Machnovites uh, created in those communities, especially with respect to the experiences of women. Uh, war communism resulted in, in the devastation of Mennonite communities, especially with grain expropriations. Of course, there's Machno's troops and their attacks. Uh, and the horrible consequences of those experiences. There's, of course, anti-Mennonite sentiment. The Mennonites organized their own Zelbschutz, and they supported the White Army, 
So a lot of Ukrainians and Russians were very suspicious of the Mennonites. There was, of course, the 1921-22 famine and disease, typhus, that spread throughout the communities. As a result of all these events, there's, of course, Mennonite homelessness and the refugee crisis. Many Mennonites had to flee to larger Mennonite communities because their own communities had been taken over uh, by lawless uh, bandits and also others who were just confiscating their property. There, of course, were the Soviet attacks against religion and the churches, and that was especially the case with respect to the Orthodox Church. The, the, the Bolsheviks very much attacked, attacked um, 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 Orthodox churches and Orthodox priests and nuns. There was, of course, a devastated Soviet economy in the early 1920s. There's the ambiguous policies regarding the draft into the Red Army. Mennonites weren't sure, are we going to be drafted in the future? And of course, there are personal reasons. There are checkered pasts, family feuds, and other reasons why Mennonites had very good reason to want to immigrate. Many families suffered multiple deaths in their families. Of course, why wouldn't you want to immigrate? Famine resulted in many people losing family members. Here are some Mennonite petitions from the Zaporizhia archives uh, from 1922 requesting permission from Soviet officials to immigrate. And quite often they're like form letters. You see the same excuses coming up over and over again. It was because of the civil war that we want to immigrate. It's because of the famine that we want to immigrate. It's because of Nestor Makhno that we want to immigrate. And of course, Mennonites did immigrate. But in the 1920s, of course, approximately 20,000 Mennonites, thereabouts, emigrated from the USSR. But the majority of Soviet Mennonites did not emigrate. And in general, they can be divided into two groups. The first group are Mennonites who wanted to emigrate, but who, for a variety of reasons, could not emigrate. Many Mennonites, because of the war and the devastation of the Civil War, had health problems, or they were just too old. They did not pass the required medical fitness exams that were necessary for immigration. There was also a lack of support or means to immigrate. Large numbers of orphans from the Civil War famine didn't have enough family members to you know, take them along uh, when they were immigrating. Uh, and of course, there were those who were institutionalized, uh, especially those who were, who were uh, held in uh, mental uh, asylums. Many larger families, it's just too big of a family to immigrate. It's just too many people. Uh, and so that was uh, another reason why some families did not immigrate. It's just too, too difficult to do so. And of course, in some families, it was the family leaders who did not want to emigrate, but who other, fa you know, other family members did. So sometimes you have this division in families where you have the wife or the children, the teenagers who want to leave. But the family, the family um, uh, husband, the family father, decided they didn't want to immigrate. So you have this division uh, within the families. And so in order to keep the family together, we're not going to immigrate. Inadequate resources. Uh, the Canadian railway uh, companies that provided many of the costs, but not all of the hard costs required for immigration, it just was too expensive uh, for some families to immigrate. And of course, there's trauma and exhaustion. Many people had PTSD after war, years of war, famine, trauma. You know, you're kind of in this paralysis. I want to go, but I, I, I'm recovering from what just happened. And it takes people a long time, especially those families that lost a lot of family members. You're kind of in this paralysis. And some families, they, they experience this paralysis for, for years. And so it's just too hard to fill out the forms, to do what's necessary to emigrate. Some people just waited too long. Uh, they, they, you know, they just waited too long to, before they applied and then it became impossible to apply. And of course, there are personal reasons to not immigrate. Duty to help family members who can't help themselves, support, support family members uh, who could not immigrate. The second group, though, are Mennonites who could immigrate, but who made the decision not to immigrate. Uh, and so this is a very interesting group, and this is what I want to focus on in the rest of my presentation. So why, what were some of the reasons why people did not want to immigrate? Why, why, did, they, why did they want to stay and continue on uh, in, um, in Ukraine? Personal reasons. Of course, they didn't want to separate from their family. They wanted to keep the family together. 
They weren't interested in surrendering their homes and their farms, even though a lot of their land had been confiscated. Some people just wanted to stay in their home. And there was good reasons to believe that they would be able to hold on to their homes. That yeah, they, they would, their farms would be smaller, but we could still hold on to our, our plot, our original um, plot of land uh, before, you know, after confiscation had happened. Of course, there's the fear of the unknown, or the fear of failure. You know, immigration, where are we going? Uh, can I handle that? You know, what happens if I fail, right? Uh, I know life here. I'm going to stay here. It makes sense for me to stay here. I don't want to go to Canada. I don't know what life is going to be like in Canada. I want to stay here. And of course, there are other reasons why people want to, uh, don't want to immigrate. And I'm not going to go into all of those, but there were other reasons as well. Of course, some Mennonites, those who were enthusiastically you know, supportive of the Bolsheviks, wanted to participate in the creation of the world's first socialist state. And that would lead to a socialist revolutions or revolutions around the world. And there were some Mennonites who were actively supportive of the Bolsheviks. And they saw this as a wonderful opportunity to bring change. You know, Tsarist Russia was not that great to all Mennonites. There were many very poor Mennonites that did not benefit under the Tsars. But now Lenin and the Bolsheviks were promising a new future, new opportunities. And what they were promising sounded a lot like some of the principles of the New Testament, right? And so why not stay and participate in this? Comrade Lenin, he's going to cleanse the earth of all of these capitalists and bring about a, a new socialist future. So maybe we should be here to help uh, in that process. Why emigrate when the Bolsheviks' new economic policy, NEP, which James Urey talked about earlier, had great promise. We're going to get rid of many of the harsh restrictions of war communism. We're going to end the policy of grain requisitioning. Peasants are going to be allowed to retain surplus grain after taxes. Farmers are going to be permitted to buy and sell their surplus goods in local markets. So there's capitalism, yes, albeit it's limited capitalism, but there was going to be opportunities for people to actually profit uh, during this time and also allow private small uh, ownership of small businesses. And because of these policies, you know, bef uh, as a result of the civil war and the famine, Russia, before NEP was introduced, Russia was about 10 percent, 11 percent uh, of what its economic productivity was just before World War I. Well, with NEP, by 1924-25, Russia has almost you know, recovered that economic loss. And it's moving forward. And so there was great promise of economic prosperity. Yes, it's not the same as you know, uh, unchecked capitalism, but within this system, we can make money. Within this system, we can grow our grain. Yeah, we're going to pay taxes, but we can sell our grain on the local markets. So, you know, what's so bad about that? Is it that terrible? Let's stay. So there was a promise of a new economic future. Many Mennonites were also active participants and leaders in their communities and their Soviet institutions. Uh, and so already in the 1920s, you see large numbers of Mennonites, typically the poor, the landless, are participating in local Soviet institutions. They are participating in the local uh, village Soviets. They are participating in varieties of, of, of Soviet institutions, not only at the village level, but at higher levels. And some Mennonites also become communist, men communist party members. It's better that we're in control of our own communities than those Ukrainians or those Russians. We should be in control. Why leave? We should be participating in the state because then we can help make decisions that are going to benefit our community. And so you here you see this kind of different levels. At the bottom level, the village level, you see, when you look at especially the archival records in Zaporizhia and other archives, you see a large number of Mennonites signing on. At the local village level, in the village, in the village Soviets, they are participating. They're signing on as different members. But also in the district level, the Volos, the Rayon level. And even by 1921, you see Mennonite names appearing at the territorial level, like the, the level that's almost like a provincial legislature or territorial legislature. So Mennonites are not just working in the local communities, they're working their way up. 
And they want to participate. They want to have some say in their communities, right? Because we want to recreate this new, uh, this new Mennonite community within this new Soviet Union. So here you see, uh, and this is uh, the Kortitsa area. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, archival records dealing with late 1920, you see these Red Army lists, Mennonites who served in the Red Army. And quite often, many villages, you'll see between eight and 10 families uh, that were Red Army supporters or people who worked or served in the Red Army and their families are getting benefits. Their families are getting support from the Red Army. You see, there's a Communist Party cell already in late 1920, and there are Mennonites that are participating in that Communist Party cell in Kortitsa. Uh, as I mentioned, many Mennonites participated in the village executive and departments already in late 1920, and you see Mennonite names as members of the Komnazon, the Komnazon, the Committee of the Village Poor. And they're members of the Committee of the Village Poor because they are the part of the, peasantly, the peasantry, the lowest levels uh, of, uh, of, of, of Soviet society, but they get benefits if you're a member of the Komnazon. You often get access to more food and you get access to land. Uh, and so many Mennonites are signing up uh, as, uh, uh, as members of these different uh, organizations. Some Mennonites sought upward social mobility in the new, new Soviet Union. Under the Romanov era, era many Mennonites you know, could not move up. They didn't have land, they didn't have economic opportunities, but oh, if I join the village Soviet, or if I join the communist Soviet, maybe I can get better housing, a better job. Right? Maybe I can have my kids go to a university. So many of the lower level uh, Mennonites are, are seeing this as a way of upward mobility. Uh, many landless Mennonites also want to participate in the organization of collectives, uh, collective farms, uh, and cooperatives. Uh, and so there's this promise that, oh, you know what, under the czars, I didn't have any land, my family didn't have any land, but now I have an opportunity through the local collective, through a cooperative, to actually participate in holding and owning land as part of a cooperative. And so this is an opportunity for people to become involved in agriculture in a way that they actually have a stake uh, in, that, uh, in that experience. So already in 1922, this is just kind of at the end of the Civil War, you see all of these little cooperatives, uh, some of them are larger collective farms, and when you look at the names of those who are members, they are Mennonite names. Right? Some of these cooperatives are quite small, maybe five families, 10 families, but some of them are larger. Uh, and when you look at the lists of who are participating in these cooperatives, these are Mennonites. Now, a lot of these cooperatives aren't gonna last very long. They're gonna kind of dissipate by 1924, 25, uh, but they still exist, uh, you know, they are oper operating in 1922. And it's because for some of these Mennonites, this is their way to participate in something that they were denied previously uh, during the Tsarist period. The Soviet government toleration of support for sectarian groups. So some Soviet leaders, such as Bons Bruvich, saw sectarians as a model for developing collectives. They saw Mennonites, Tolstoyans, as they, they know what it, what it means to operate these kind of cooperative societies. And we can use them as a model for future development of, uh, of Soviet collective farms. And so there were some, not all Soviet government leaders, but there were some who said, we should encourage these Mennonites to keep, keep doing what they're doing because they provide a good model uh, for, um, uh, for future collective farms. There's also increasing toleration of churches and church organizations, at least until 1926 and 27. Compared to the Orthodox Church, the Mennonites actually have it pretty easy. Right? And they, of course, some of these Soviet leaders want to encourage Mennonites to do this, to develop these kind of cooperative societies. And you have to do that uh, in a way that allows them to have some degree of religious toleration. The Soviet government supported Mennonite organizations, and we've talked about the Union of Dutch Citizens, uh, Citizens of Dutch Lineage, All Russian Mennonite Agricultural Session, Association. They provided uh, concessions, not always granted to other groups. They helped to develop Mennonite economic associations and concessions for reconstruction. So Mennonites seem to have it in with this, the Ukrainian leadership. Well, if they have an in and we're getting concessions and they're working together for reconstruction, that's another positive sign, sign to stick around and to help with the re reconstruction effort. 
Koronizatia, uh, the Soviet nationality policy, protected the interests of nationality, national minority groups. Already in 23, 24, the Soviet government said, we have to get these national minority groups, Germans, uh, you know, Jews, others to participate in the creation of this new socialist state. And so that means in larger German communities, in larger Jewish communities, we will let them conduct their affairs, even government affairs, in their own language. So in 19, between 1923-24 and 1927-28, there are at least nine of these large German districts, two of which are Mennonites, where Mennonites are able to conduct their affairs in German. They didn't have to do it in Russian. Uh, and so that was another sign that the Mennonites, that the Soviet government was going to be very tolerant uh, to minority groups. And also to allow them to conduct, conduct uh, their schools in, in, German, in the German language. So that was also uh, another uh, important uh, development. Some Mennonites viewed immigration as an act of betrayal, if not treason, against the Soviet fatherland. Oh, you only leave when, time gets, when times get tough, but you were born here. What is your allegiance? Your allegiance is to Russia. Russia has changed. Russia is moving in another direction. But now, why do you want to leave when things get a little bit tough? Aren't you loyal? And so there's, this, there's a sense among some Mennonites that those who are leaving were betraying them, betraying their communities, betraying them by their country. Some Mennonites viewed immigration as abandoning the Mennonite community at a time when the community was very vulnerable. You just leave because of your own personal interests. You're not interested in helping us. Why don't you help us? Why are you leaving? Oh yeah, we all had tough times. We all suffered, but let's rebuild. Right? Why are you taking off and leaving, uh, leaving us uh, when, we need, uh, when we need your help? There were also reports of life on the Canadian prairies that are not always positive. Many farmers, including farmers in, uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, uh, Manitoba, were not all that interested in bringing over uh, these Russian Mennonites. And, and there was also reports of these bitterly cold winters in Manitoba. You know, it, you know, southern Russia is a whole lot warmer than Manitoba. Why would we want to go there? And there were also some cases where Mennonites had actually emigrated to Canada, and then they come back because they had a tough winter or whatever. So, oh, it's not so great over there. It's not the, you know, the land of milk and honey like everybody says. Let's just stay here because it seems to make more sense. Mennonite immigration made life worse for those Mennonites who remained in the Soviet Union. Because so many Mennonites were leaving, Soviet officials started wondering, well, like, what's going on? You know, you, you want to allow some Mennonites to immigrate because there's an overpopulation, there's not enough land, but are all of you leaving for other reasons? Is it economic reasons? Is it, is it reasons that we did not initially permit? Uh, and by the late 1920s, Soviet officials are often defining Mennonites as agitators for immigration. You know, Mennonites are kulaks. Mennonites are supporters of the white revolutionaries, uh, which is the same kind of categories that they use for other groups, Ukrainians. But Mennonites, different than Ukrainians and other groups, they are agitators for immigration. They just want to agitate. They are disloyal. They are treasonous, right? So it's because of this immigration that we've created all kinds of problems for those who have left behind because they are agitating for immigration. Some final observations. In the early 1920s, there were many reasons for Mennonites to immigrate from the Soviet Union. But I've explained there were also reasons for why Mennonites did not want to immigrate. During NEP, many Mennonites were optimistic about the future of the Soviet Union. Of course, after the rise of Stalin in the late 1920s and the end of NEP, in 1928 and the implementation of dekulakization, collectivization of the Great Terror in the 1930s, many Mennonites in the Soviet Union had serious regrets about emig not emigrating earlier. But hindsight is always 2020. For those who remain in the Soviet Union, immigration in the 1920s caused no end of problems for them. By the mid-1920s, Soviet officials became increasingly suspicious about Mennonites and their loyalty to the Soviet Union, especially after the, the Verband leader, the, the, the union leader, Bibi Jans, fled uh, under the, you know, 
uh, under very suspicious circumstances. Why is he fleeing? Is there something, that, is he doing, participating in illegal activities? Soviet officials increasingly, increasingly characterized Mennonites as agitators for immigration, disloyal to the Soviet Union, and enemies of the state because of the large number of people that, that emigrated from their communities. Immigration was one reason why Mennonites experienced more arrests, expulsions, imprisonments, exiles, and executions than many other groups during dekulakization, collectivization, and the Great Terror. Thank you. Thank you for your applause. Thank you, scholars, for your wonderful presentation. And so it's time for answers, for, for questions, and then for answers. OK. A lot of hands. Uh, Advan der Stey. Uh, very interesting uh, lectures by uh, Johannes and Colin. Uh, because they're opposed, so I'm very curious about what Johannes will have to say on the thesis of um, Colin. So that's one. And the other is about the relation of the cooperatives you showed in Gatitsa and the Verband. Uh, because I uh, read that uh, the Verband uh, was um, accused by the communists of not being a real cooperative and um, being... Uh, opposite to the cooperative policy of the uh, communists. So all these cooperatives you show in 1922, um, did they uh, go up in the Verband or not? Or what was the relationship between the two? Thanks for the question. Uh, well, they're, they're, the Verband is very much organize, organizing cooperative kind of trade associations, right? So whereby Mennonites work together in organizing like a, you know, a, an association to sell their agricultural products. Uh, but you didn't have to be part of a collective to be part of that. You, you were just part of a larger, um, a, an association organized by the Verband to, to help with the sale of your goods. Just like, you know, dairy farmers belong to an association to sell their milk. Uh, or egg farmers, right? It's that same kind of principle. But the, the collectives that we're looking at, that I'm looking at in, the, in, 19, you know, in 1921 especially, the, the Farband is really not really organized at that point. These are definitely collective farms that were organized in, in the Soviet context of Soviet collectives. A lot of them are just cooperatives, but they are also collectives. And some of them are very, you know, they, they try to, they're experimenting. They're trying different ways of, how does this collective farm, what, what's the best way of doing it? Do we go with the Taz? Do we go with the commune, right? Do we go with the Artel? Those are the three main types of, uh, of collective farms. And so they're experimenting. Later on, in late 1929, 1930, there's no time to experiment. You, you have to you have to join the collective farm that your community organizes. You can't experiment with different types. But in this early stage, they are very much experimenting, right? And so, so especially those who have no land whatsoever, nothing to contribute, they belong to the commune, typically, because they're just, they're just joining as members without land. But those who have land, right, you know, 10, 20, 30 hectares, they often belong to an artel, the first kind of artels that are being established, where they, they have some ownership rights in their land, but they're also sharing equipment. They're sharing cattle and livestock. And like I said, a lot of those will not last for very long, but you see these first signs, and you see the, often the poorest members of the Mennonite community participating in this because they see this as an opportunity that, that may provide them with great advantage. And, you know, this is all still part of the experiment that's going on. And so nothing is defined, nothing is written in stone. Later on, when Stalin implements decolonization, collectivization, that experiment is over, we're going in this direction, whether you like it or not. Can I add something? Yes, use my position. 
today. So I just very appreciate to Colin to, for his, you know, a kind of um, psychology approach because it's very, very important. And I agree with him on the other side that really Mennonites, um, you know, found themselves in a trap because, uh, you know, their, uh, their previous history experience was very important. Because the life of Mennonites uh, in Russian Empire was always turbulent, but after the period of crisis, you know, the situation became normal. And so maybe I think they thought the same way. But in 1920s, um, all the things were changing so quickly. So you just think that you can do something, you have a lot of opportunities, but click. And no, you have not any opportunities. So it was so, so quick, everything. And if even, you know, 1922, they registered the union, if you ask about Fairbund, but just in a year, they already trumped up, you know, articles against the union. So just one year, and completely different situation. But you already trapped. So you, you can do anything, you don't have any exit. So, and that is, I agree. But only one question for me. When, when they arranged, you know, national uh, districts, na national German districts, they promised everything, language, education, but not religious. No. What happened to Mennonites? Why did they agree with it at that time? You know, I think, you know, there was, someone talked about Ukrainization. Ukrainization was being pushed, and, and for, for Mennonites, Koronizatsi had an opportunity for them to preserve their German language without, especially if they had a large enough German population, they wouldn't have to have Ukrainianization in the same way. They could still have their German language, they could run their district Soviets in German, and when you look at those records, all of those minutes are in German. Sometimes they're both in German and Russian, but they're often in German. And so for them, you know, you see this as kind of little baby steps. We're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and eventually maybe we'll have more religious freedom compared to what was going on in the Orthodox Church and the confiscation of Orthodox lands, the persecution, like I forget the number, like 20,000 priests were killed in the first years of the Soviet rule, priests and nuns. Well, the Mennonites didn't experience that. So, oh, well, they, there is some degree of respect for the Mennonite way of life, and some Soviet leaders see the Mennonites as a possible conduit to creating collective farms. They, they just have to deal with their religion, but we're going to allow them some degree of religious um, freedom, and, and it's not until later on in the 19, you know, late 1920s, early 1930s that you start really having that persecution of pastors uh, and that closure of churches. But in the, in the 1920s, many churches were able to operate with pastors, right? They, they couldn't do the same thing as they did prior to the revolution in terms of their religious practices and freedoms. But compared to other groups, especially the Orthodox, this is pretty good. Right? And so I see them, I see them as hopeful. You know, compared to, the, compared to the Civil War and the famine, this was actually a pretty good time. Right? Life, there was peace, and there was these economic opportunities. And oh, maybe the Bolsheviks realized that we have to kind of take this middle road between socialism and full-blown full capitalism. We have to create this kind of mixed you know, socialism, mixed capitalism, and, and even some Soviet leaders, like Bukharin said, let the pre peasants enrich themselves because we've gone through this terrible time of civil war. We have to allow the peasants to enrich themselves, otherwise we're gonna lose the revolution, we're gonna lose their support. Just a great examples how we can't explain a lot of things without psychology, just great examples. And so on. And of course, it was a kind of transitional identity, I think. It was transitional period and transitional identity. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is John Neufeld. I'd like to ask a question of Professor Neufeld. No relation, I believe. 
I was wondering, did, did Mennonites give any thought to what was happening in Canada at the time? In other words, did any of them think or know about what was happening to indigenous people in Canada uh, by the arrival of settlers, not just Mennonites, but Europeans? They were pushing out, you know, whether they liked to do it or not, they were pushing out the indigenous people. Did any Mennonites think maybe we should not be participating in that process? Or did they not know what was happening here? I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of Mennonites being aware of, uh, of this kind of settler colonization uh, uh, of the West. I'm not saying that there weren't, but I'm not aware of that. I'm not sure if anybody else is aware of that. Uh, I mean, a lot of these issues have only become, you know, more recently discussed in kind of public forums and that. And, 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 and it's great that we have this acknowledgement of, you know, whose land this is. It's great that we're acknowledging, you know, that these indigenous populations were here first and that we are just, you know, people that have come on and, and you know, participate in the, in the creation of Canada. But at that time, you know, it, when you've gone through war and civil war and famine, you know, you have to think, am I going to stay here? Am I going to go over there? And those indigenous issues, at least I'm not aware of them being, being part of the discussion. I could be wrong, but I don't know of anybody else. So uh, un unfortunately, we don't have time anymore, and so we need to come to the next panel. Thank you for your participation, listening, asking for your attention.